As a catalyst for our participation today, we've assembled this incredible panel of experts, many of them who you've already met, but I do want to introduce everyone uh, again and make sure that you know who is joining me. Uh, Tiffany Chalk is the co-chair of the Education and Prevention Committee of the Healthy Mother and Infant Consortium and is the consumer representative appointed to the consortium by the governor. A professional event planner, Tiffany comes to the work of the consortium with great passion for improving birth outcomes in Delaware and deep empathy for families that have suffered the loss of a baby. Dr. Daniel Frayne is joining us. You heard him speak earlier in the program, family physician, North Carolina's Mountain Area Health Education Center, where he serves as president. He's associate professor of the University of North Carolina's Chapel Hill School of Medicine for the past 17 years and has provided full spectrum care as a family physician, including obstetrics. Dr. Arthur James, as you heard, Dr. Rattay introduced him earlier. He is an obstetrician, gynecologist, and pediatrician. During, it's close to family medicine, right? Can I claim that? <laughs> or no? Too close. Okay. Uh, during the entire medical career, he has advocated for health equity and birth outcomes, especially in underserved populations. As a medical director at several facilities in other states, he was instrumental in expanding services to indigent patients, patients using drugs, HIV positive pregnant patients, and to teens. And then Ken Harris, he's the Vice President for Community Engagement and the Director of the New Haven Healthy Start Program at the Community Foundation for Greater New Haven in New Haven, Connecticut. His professional career in public health span spans almost 35 years. He's the past president of the National Healthy Start Association and the association's representative for the Dads Matter Initiative, Where Dads Matter. And last but not least, Dr. Lene Lawyer is Chief Medical Officer for Amer Health Caritas Delaware. In that role, Dr. Lawyer is responsible for the health plan's clinical and educational initiatives that drive member health outcomes, such as care management, medical education, quality management. She's worked with Medicaid and other government health programs for more than 20 years. So join me in welcoming the panel uh, to the stage. <laughs> So we're going to get started with a question for each panelist, um, but then I hope that each of you will also think of some questions that you would like to ask. So we'll start at the far end with Tiffany. Tiffany, from a patient perspective, how does the provider-patient relationship positively or negatively affect maternal mortality? So I think the provider-patient relationship could affect both positively and negativity. With this relationship being the single most hallmark of the quality of care is the reason why it can go on both ends. So I say that because what needs to be built from the relationship is actually what we lack, what I myself also lacked in my provider relationships. And that's the trust, that's the security, that's the even the encouragement to take an active role in my own health care. And also, you know, as a consumer, we like to have, we like the education of our providers, but we also like to have that shared decision-making process. So depending on those circumstances, it could go one way or the other. I myself have been on both sides of it. I've had excellent provider patient relationship and I, I truly believe that affected the quality of my care and then I've had negative where it was added stress it was added turmoil for my family and I really had adverse outcomes in my health care due to the negativity in our relationship so it's both sides for me Dr. Frain, from a provider perspective, describe what this looks like for both the patient and provider. Yeah, so I, I would echo all of that. You know, in this work, what it's come down to is that I do believe it's all about relationship. Um, the relationship needs to go both ways, both by, from provider to patient and patient to provider, because when you have relationship, you think differently, um, you act differently, and you are able to partner in decisions um, we have to find ways of actually developing relationship even in a brief encounter. And what that actually looks like is putting the patient in the center. And as a clinician, what we have to be doing is to stop the paradigm of thinking that we know best. What we need to be thinking is that what we have is knowledge and we're a gatekeeper to resources. And so by asking questions 
and getting what the patient understands, what the patient desires, what the patient's needs are, we can then be an advocate for that patient. It's a simple reframing of instead of what am I doing to you to what, what can I do with you and for you. That is the kind of thing that we need to be doing on an interaction basis that can change relationships. Thank you. Dr. James, um, you had a chance to give some explanation about the underlying causes that are contributing to black maternal and infant health, but we know that it's not just one issue alone. Could you uh, describe a bit more about what you see as the root causes and the risk factors and how we can work in the black community to improve that? Sure. I think I'd like to answer that question within the context of the two previous um, panelists' response um, and remind us all of <clears throat> a guy named Ronald David who is a retired uh, neonatologist in California who's now an Episcopal priest. And <clears throat> one of the things that Dr. David taught me was his theory of what he refers to as relationality. Um, that relationship is primary and everything else is derivative. That we all live and die in relationship. Um, we live our lives uh, in relationship. So <clears throat> within that context then let me talk a bit about the things that I discussed uh, this morning and, and to more directly answer your question. I think that, you know, within America, um, as much as we don't like to admit it, um, we, we live in an apartheid country where, as I've said earlier, that we provide significant advantage to one group while simultaneously exposing other groups to significant disadvantage. And we tolerate that our relationship with those marginalized groups adversely influences uh, their health. And it's not just African Americans. You look at what this country has done relative to Native Americans as another example. But we've marginalized them to reservations where as a group they experience the lowest life expectancy of any group in our country where next to African Americans they have the highest infant mortality rate. Those things don't, they haven't happened um, by happenstance. And as I, I said earlier, the, 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 their, their, the occurrence of those adverse um, outcomes is not, is not by accident. It's by design. It's the way we've made ourselves in this country. And in terms of those relationships that we have with each other as people and with um, components of our various communities, uh, we have to we have to make the decision and develop the political will to change things if we want our outcomes to improve. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. James. So we also know there's growing research that racism and inequality play a role. And that role is subtle, it's overt in different places. Uh, to Ken, could you outline two to three inequities that exist for black women today and that play a role in black maternal and infant outcomes? Yeah, and again, uh, just building off what was said before, I think all of it's a part of it. And so again, the inequities that I'll point out today are definitely in the backdrop of racism. And I just wanted to say, um, with your presentation, Michelle, it just reminds me that we need to remind folks always that race is an illusion, but racism is real. And so the three that I'll talk about is treatment and when African-American women are black women. And I think treatment because there's, there are many biases about her, who she is, and the descriptors of her, which she doesn't have power over, so that narrative of those biases about her and opinions about her. And her fate is often in the hands of white women, and that's an equal relationships, whether it be with Department of Social Services or in clinical settings or whatever. So I see inequities there in those relationships. Uh, and then when she speaks out, um, she's usually described as an angry black woman. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's, she's received differently. So the treatment, for sure. And I think the value, and just from historical perspectives, her value of her body has been lessened. Um, her voice She's often disregarded and dismissed, and that's unequal. Again, in earlier studies with opioid, opium, as well as those experiments done on black bodies, women's black bodies historically. 
Uh, and then the third area will be opportunities. I see inequities there um, when you look in the workforce. So with jobs, her opportunities are different from others, including among women. Black women are treated differently. Um, as business owners, and these, uh, for me, the experience of working with black business uh, women, uh, business owners, my mother being one for 37 years in Boston, just a difference in how hard it was for her to get um, loans and different things and, and setting up accounts at um, different beauty supply places that wouldn't give it to her. Uh, hiring practices, we see it. I think at the leadership, it's harder for black women to attain leadership. And when she does, she often has to fight with her white counterparts. So that's unequal treatment even in the um, workforce. And then just that marginalization. And I think, again, thank you, Michelle, but the other is in uh, earnings. So again, 80% for uh, white women compared to every dollar a man earns and 63 cents for black women. So those three areas. Thank you, Ken. I have a feeling you could have gone on. <laughs> so uh, you've thought about this. I also wanted to underscore that statistics show that black babies are more likely to be, bo be born before 37 weeks and are more likely to be born very premature or at 28 or 32 weeks and are more likely to bo be born at low or what we call very low birth weights. Dr. Lawyer, in your experience, what are some of the contributing factors to black infants being born too soon and too small? Uh, so I think that our, uh, pan our presenters today, Dr. Frayne and Dr. James, have uh, gone over that very well. But to sum up, um, chronic disease, cardiovascular disease, uh, diabetes, obesity, not being well managed, uh, contributed, contributes to preterm birth. Um, one of the elephants in the room, substance use disorder, not being managed. Um, and Dr. Frayne called it toxic stress. Um, I call it the superwoman syndrome. It's where black women have a tendency to uh, take care of everyone but themselves, to do everything for everybody else but themselves, and not listen to that inner voice that says something's going wrong, ignoring that voice because they've got to get the kids to soccer, or they've got to get the husband this, or they've got to get this for the job, or get this project completed. So. Um, all of those things, and again, very well elucidated by Dr. Frayne and Dr. James this morning, but uh, those are my top three. So this is for any panelist. Um, as you know, the state is clearly committed to making improvements. What resources do we need or have in our communities now to help ensure more positive birth outcomes for black women? Anyone can take that. <laughs> I, I'll speak from a consumer. Uh, perspective. I believe, you know, in the state of Delaware, we do have a lot of resources, but the access to those resources to me are questionable. And if the resources are at a grassroots level to really reach the demographic of black women that it needs to reach. And then I also think, so for me, there's two segments of where the resources could be up leveled, one being I feel like there's a gap. So there's resources with a certain population, but then there's a gap of the professional black woman who might be over the age of 30, who is going to a private practice, not a wellness center or a community health-based center. What, how can we bridge that gap for the resources, for someone like myself, for just going through, I was a married mother of one at 32 when I experienced my first premature baby, and I didn't have the knowledge that if I would have went to a West Side Health or a Lored Health or something of that nature that I needed from my OB at that time. So I really feel like, for me, I would like to maybe address or if continue the dialogue on how we can also bridge that gap so the resources can cross all facets of the black woman population, not just one population. Thank you, Tiffany. Are there other strategies that have worked in, in other states that Delaware should consider adopting? I would say the, the Federal Healthy Start program, which is funding 100 programs around the country, but when it started in 1991, there were only 15 programs. The unique piece with that was that it mandated that consumers and community be part of those programs, and that still remains a mandate to this date. And as Dr. James showed, there's been great improvements because you involve the people impacted by the problem. So as far as a resource, in my opinion, it's at the community, and it's really a human capital, and looking at the people impacted by the problem and sit back and listen a little bit more. 
So I would say that, you know, Delaware has a couple of, of opportunities. I mean, you've already demonstrated success in your statewide initiative around contraceptive access. And the thing that we need to think about is that to assure that those access projects, those access programs are access to equitable care. That's where the opportunity is. You've expanded Medicaid, that's great. You have contraceptive access, that's great. Now make sure that it's equitable the kind of care you provide, so that when women receive the care, it's in that context of that relationship and equity. I think I would add to that <clears throat> a component of my talk that I didn't get to expand or, or get to mention much, and um, <clears throat> that's the whole notion of proportionate or targeted universalism, which to build off of what Dr. Frain just said, <clears throat> It's one thing to talk about um, improving or working to improve outcomes in one segment of the population at a faster pace than you improve the same outcomes in another segment of the population without compromising what you do to improve outcomes for this segment of the population that is doing better. So how do you do that? <clears throat> and I think proportionate or targeted universalism is one of the ways that we do that which in essence says to us that um, our interventions for any segment of the population need to occur at a scale and intensity proportionate to the level of the problem in that community. That means then that where <clears throat> disparate outcomes are involving um, um, black infants or their mothers, <clears throat> that the intensity and scale of our interventions for the black community is going to be significantly um, different than it is in other communities where outcomes are, are, are better. So that this whole notion of doing the same thing across the board for everybody is not, is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about doing more for the communities that have suffered the most from this. Uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> and that's an extremely important piece of this. It's one of the linchpins to uh, understanding how we decrease and eventually eliminate the disparities that we see, not just in birth outcomes, by the way, but across the board, so that if we want to address it in terms of educational outcomes, in terms of poverty, in terms of unemployment rates, then that, that, that same formula applies. I, I know one of the answers you'll probably say is the fact that AmeriHealth is here in Delaware and you have a huge leadership uh, role in how we provide care for our Medicaid populations. Do you want to share other ideas about resources that the state could could help in partnership or get the word out about AmeriHealth and what you're doing around social determinants? Sitting next to the Secretary of Health. <laughs> um, I think that addressing the social determinants of health is what AmeriHealth Caritas uh, was founded on. We were founded by the Sisters of Mercy over 40 years ago. And here in Delaware, we just opened a wellness center. Um, it's in Bear, Delaware. And it's a space for people to come to learn about health issues, uh, to present different topics. Um, and I hope that Michelle will, will come and uh, give some lectures. Um, but addressing all social determinants of health, be it education, uh, be it uh, food deserts, um, transportation, um, these are the things that we're working on at AmeriHealth Caritas, and I know the state is working on also. So one of the questions that we'll all want to leave with is how can everyone here in the room add their voice? add their voice to the vision, add their voice to the action plan. What are some of the important roles that we can provide um, as concerned citizens, as um, professionals in our respective areas? Would anyone have thoughts that they'd like to share about that? What roles would you like us to play after leaving today? Oh. Um, I think that the title, when I walked in and saw the title of the conference, I don't know how I missed this before, but Raising Our Voices, Strengthening Our Communities, and Advocating for Healthy Women, Men, Babies, and Families. 
I think that's um, the takeaway message, raising our voices in terms of not the pitch or tone of our voice, but advocacy, um, being an advocate for yourself, being an advocate for your community, um, strengthening our communities, being here, seeing the exhibitors, seeing you know all that is here in Delaware, and then advocating for healthy women, men, babies, and families. Um, I just met Sonia Blake, who uh, related an episode where she went with someone um, to an OBGYN visit, and um, it perhaps didn't go as well as she thought it should, but I said that you were there, you were able to point out some things and be able to be an advocate for someone, and I think being an advocate at the policy level and on the personal level is what we need. Yeah, I think I would add to that <clears throat> from a general perspective is, is because this comes up a lot where people want to know <clears throat> what <clears throat> specifically they can do. Understanding that everyone, everyone has a part to play in this. That <clears throat> I think it's important for you to understand that you start where, where, wherever you are so that the initial conversation you, you, you have could be with the person sitting next to you, it could be with your spouse, it could be with your family. But then you spread from there. You talk to members of your social clubs or your churches. Um, you start where you are and you arrange collaborative relationships that help you accomplish the goals that need, that need to be accomplished. There's, there's nobody that's left out of this formula. And it's going to take all of us to achieve the changes that we need to see in order to get the results we want to get. Thank you, Dr. James. Are there questions in the audience? And if you have a question, there are, there's a microphone right over here. If you do have a question for any of the panelists. Thank you, Terry Walker. I'd like to add just Please. a quick note really, that I think is really important. As we're raising our voices, I would like to say, you know, for us to be mindful to respect our patients or your patients' values, their preferences, and their expressed needs. Involve your patients in the decision-making process, recognizing that we are, as a consumer, individuals who have our own unique values and preferences, and treat that with dignity, respect, and sensitivity to his or her cultural needs. Thank you, Tiffany. Dr. Frain, you also look like you had well, so I just wanted to say that another actionable item, you know, so speaking to the white people in the room is to listen and learn. So this journey requires us to actually understand the history of our country, to recognize our privilege and what we've received from it, so that then we can stop being afraid or uncomfortable with it and start to be part of the solution in changing it. It's got to come from us. If we are not on board with this, we'll keep doing exactly what we've been doing because it's worked for 400 years. Is there a question in the audience? The, micro the microphone is missing. So someone has it. <laughs> somebody wants to talk. Oh, there it is. <laughs> See a question. I think we have time for one or two. Hi, Karen McLaughlin. I work in public health, and thank you so much for all that you've addressed here today. I was just curious if you could talk about how we've, we're making changes with um, the training of new providers of care as they come through the education system before they go out into the public so that they have a better understanding of these issues. It's a huge, um, hugely critical point. And I have to say that um, as a nation, we're not there yet. We're starting to have those conversations. So, so I'm involved in medical student training. I'm involved in residency education and training. And what I just said earlier is the key point to that is that we're gonna have to require and to include racial equity training to include changes in practices in how, who gets into medical school and who gets into residency, how we select processes. It's all part of the big uh, picture. And right now, it is not a standard 
in medical education or in residency education, but we're going to need to make it part of it. Question. I mean, and some of the issues are how do we educate everyone in society, not just providers, around implicit bias. Um, and what are the interventions to deal with that? Michelle, you mentioned it. It is a challenge in medicine that does impact what treatment people receive and how we interpret diagnoses, particularly in mental health and how that plays a role. So hopefully, collectively, the medical field will take that on, but it is a, a huge challenge. Other questions? I see a microphone floating. Please. Hi. Uh, just because there's not a long line at the <laughs> microphone, um, I'm Annie Norman, the state librarian, and uh, secretary and to all the panel. Just wanted to point out that we're here, libraries are here, and we are happy to help you get the word out to the public. So we're all connected. Please use us to uh, spread your message. Thank you. Well, we're getting close to lunch, so we don't want people to be too hungry. Um, what is a good first step that you'd like to see happen immediately to improve outcomes for black women and babies in Delaware? And if you could, talk about what's the single most important contributor to making this change happen. We'll just go down the panel. Oh, okay. You get to be first. <laughs> you get to be first. Yes. Um, Black Maternal Health Awareness Week is um, April 11th through the 17th, so I think one of the first steps I would like to see is everybody who's on Twitter, everybody who's on Instagram, Facebook, um, hashtag um, Black Maternal, aware black maternal uh, Awareness to get that message out. I think that getting something, getting momentum through social media will help to get the message out. Um, I think that's a great first step. And what was the other question? Uh, we, what is the single most contributor to making the change happen? Getting the word out is part of that, certainly, but maybe there are other things that you think the state should take on. I think continuing to have this, this conference um, and maybe even expanding it is a great opportunity for people to come together in Delaware and, again, to see and hear uh, what's going on in the country in a concentrated environment is excellent. So I'd like to see more of this. <laughs> can, can we have a question? Give me uh, more work. <laughs> Um, I work for the National Fatherhood Initiative, and I haven't heard fathers mentioned in all this. They're the other half of the equation. So I just wanted some thoughts on, you know, if <laughs> folks didn't know we exist and that there are resources for dads to be involved and moms do better when fathers are involved in the pregnancy um, health-wise. So we have some information up there, but I just wanted your thoughts on that. Yes, so one thing you can do immediately is go visit the table at National Fatherhood Initiative for sure. <laughs> and uh, the and one Daddy of, Boot Camp. <laughs> yes, and one of the most popular curricula is 24-7 Dad. And so um, that's an evidence-based curricula that's used um, predominantly uh, among the Healthy Start sites. So it's a very good curriculum to use. Certainly dads play a role, but the thing I would say with the fatherhood, and I was one of the original NFI members 100 years ago, um, but one thing I would say is we're engaged the fathers of the women and families we're talking about. These men are coming to us broken, so we also are emphasizing men's health. So if there's anything you can do around lifting up men's health, then to do that, make sure men that are getting checkups and so forth. I would say the other thing, just to echo um, uh, my colleague next door to me, is that the Black Maternal Health Week is so important. And I think um, her suggestion to get involved in your social media accounts is very important. The other thing I would say, just in your personal circles, just talk about it as well, because not everyone's on those sites. But make sure you're talking about it. Talk to your friends, talk to your sisters, and talk to the men as well. Because I think um, Christopher Johnson, who's the husband of Kira Johnson, uh, he uh, drafted the bill. Uh, so I think it's important to show men are part of that conversation too. Yeah, I'd just like to add to that, <clears throat> it's to, to, hold, to hold your leadership both here in the state, um, but also at your local level and at the national level, to hold our leadership accountable um, and to vote. Get out and vote. Make your voice matter. So my two things that I think we should do is one is include pregnancy intention screening into routine care, document it and measure it. It changes context, it changes medical decision making and management. That's a simple one. The second one 
is to, like I said earlier, educate ourselves on racial equity. There's lots of great books out there and podcasts. A really great recent one, if you want to write this one down, is the podcast series from NPR on called Seeing Whiteness. It is really powerful and it gives you everything you need to start your journey. I concur to what everyone else has said. <laughs> I think, but I, don't, I can't really add to it, but I will say I would want to end it with this. Don't forget the message. Don't forget the reason why we have 300 people plus in this room when you walk out of this room. Thank you, Tiffany. So please join me in thanking our panelists for this engaging and important discussion. <laughs>